doesn't explain why you've come all the way out here. All the way out here to hell. I, uh, I have a job out in the town of Machine. Machine? That's the end of the line. Is it? Yes. On October 12th, 1996, in St. John's, Newfoundland, I got into my truck and I drove away. I mean, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have a clue. I mean, all I wanted to do was get away. At some point, I realized I, I had to at least have some sort of destination in mind, so when I hit Montreal, I grabbed a guy, a complete stranger, right off the street, and I told him, give me a direction of the compass, and uh, to which he replied, north, of course. So I pulled out the map, and uh, the end of the line and going north is Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. So now I knew where I was going. I mean, what is a memory? 
It's not a replaying. I mean, a memory is not a replaying of an event. The event happened a long time ago, and it doesn't exist anymore. It's something that happened in the past, and, and all you're doing when you uh, sort of bring up a memory in your head is you're taking out a little camera in your brain and showing it for your own little viewing pleasure. And that's all it is. And what, what is that memory? What is that memory made out of? I mean, our memory, our brain makes these things out of electrochemical impulses and that is all it is it's chemical electrical and what is that that's the same as a computer language it's binary off and on zeros and ones that's all it is so anytime that we have a memory or we see something or we smell something it comes into our brains as a strip of code it comes out as a series of zeros and ones and an, an image that we saw all the tastes everything we felt all the sounds it's all the smells it's all listed up we, we have this 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 inability to mistrust our own heads. I think that's reasonable. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we haven't had the ability to change it yet, to manipulate it. I mean, it always seems to me that the minute something is changed or we have the ability to affect it, uh, then we lose our trust in it. I mean, let's look at the TV. The TV, for the longest time, had always been considered sort of this source of complete, honest truth. If you see it, it happened, and that was as simple as it went. And uh, as far as the 40s, 50s, 60s, I mean, that, that was the way we saw the image. I mean, it was bringing the truth to you to your homes. What happens is that you get, I guess in 1974, you get the video game Pong. You know, that little game with the the little blip that goes across the screen and you use your paddles to sort of not like table tennis sort of you know even though it was a simple little silly game was also the point the very first point in which the image of the screen of the television screen could be changed could be manipulated could be altered and it could be altered by the person watching and that completely changes the way you see that sort of thing that rock-hard source of truth now becomes something that anybody can change. And, it's, and I mean, this develops over time, and we, we have, you know, the ability to change any sort of image. And with, with any sort of ability to ma manipulate, you have sort of a healthy cynicism associated with it. What does that mean, though? Because what that means is that we're manipulating the brain. And once you start to manipulate the brain, do we lose our trust in it? With all the cities I keep running into, there's still a lot of the same things despite the distance. No matter where you go, common elements bind these people together, like signage of universal civilization. When I was in a Central Asian desert, my efforts to escape the Western world was continually thwarted, even in what I had felt was the last bastion against America. I was seeing signs of Coca-Cola, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Metallica. An entire society distilled down to a soft drink a movie star, and a rock and roll band. I'll be back. Every city used to have a wall surrounding it, defining it. The relationship of city versus the world was a clearly defined one of antagonism and power struggle. For hundreds of years, the inclusion of the outside into our own urban landscape was an image of control and domination. The vegetation was warped and twisted and bent to obey our rules. It was maintained and manicured so that it was always kept on our leash. It's strange. The point in which the walls of Rome were broken to allow the aqueducts through has always been considered a significant moment in time. The moment where the city no longer held its solidarity from the world around it. No one even coughed at the moment we let the wilderness in. It's been allowed to flow over the walls and grow out of control in and among our suburbs like some sylvan backdrop. Technology effused with such a power over the environment so that we can create our own and inevitably it has left an objective gaze upon the world. The lawn makes no sense anyway. Well, in a way it does. It's an artificial object made up of natural material in order to represent nature and is a replacement for what should naturally be growing in its place. The lawn is the world's first glimpse of virtual reality. The lawn is curious, but the green belt is bizarre. The green belt is a strip of untamed wilderness crawling in between rows of suburban lots. What the hell is that thing doing there? Is it a backdrop for a society craving authenticity? Is this a desire to gain back even a token of that frontier we once admired only after it was already gone? Journey of 
look at it in the same way. You see it that since everyone sees the same thing, well, it's not as important. The things that really seem to be for you, to mold you, to, to make something more of you, to make you unique, are the things that you experience that no one else has. And the only place you're going to find it is out here. But I wonder in the end how important that is, that experience, that unique experience out here. How much does this place have to offer? When I reached Yellowknife, uh, nothing was what I'd expected. No igloos, few 12-story apartment buildings, no whale blubber. There was an A and W. In fact. Not one thing in your knife closely resembled what I propped up to be this 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 mythical end of the line land. A movie called Old Town that is basically inhabited by one room log cabins insulated with blankets, and I find a place with a secretary who talks to her cat more often than human beings and keeps a very sharp axe by the door. She decorates the entire house with maps of all kinds as well as loose leaf with faces scrawled into them with crayon. She's not much of a secretary as she is continually losing her jobs for throwing things like staplers and heavy books at her fellow employees. And there's my other roommate, Tung, who's from Vietnam and can't speak very much English and plays cock rock bands like Poison and Meatloaf at top volume. He's involved in the booming cocaine trade here in the city and he has a side job of helping out pimps along the strip where you'll find the Golden Range, a bar guaranteed to end every night with broken noses, broken bottles, and a country western song. I hang out a lot at the crack house, named not for any reason of prolific drug use, but for the fact that five girls all live there under the same roof and their periods are all in sync, so you have a week each month where it looks like a crack house. They're all heavy drinkers except for May, who only does crystal meth and refuses to date a man unless he has a cock ring. Tracy's an artist who uses the walls of the house as her canvas. Tanya was soon to run away with a 50-year-old blues guitar an alien had a habit of sleeping under her bed or outside on the lawn, but only in the summer months, of course. I met Anthony in a bar, and as we shared smokes and rum, he told me he'd come down from Baffin Island. He lived with Corey, who lived in a bus with a newfie called Three Fingered Ian because of his lack of digits on his hand. Corey played in a band and tried to drive away to Argentina in the bus, but only made it to Calgary before it broke down. Efren, Deanne, April, and Jamie lived together in a small house, always contagious with activity. Before I fell in love with Deanne, I was wandering with her and a hippie chick from Vancouver after a large amount of weed we had smoked. It was three in the morning, and we were, it was three in the morning, and we were singing at our loudest in a clear effort to gain the appreciation of those we woke up in the surrounding houses. I fell to my back and saw the northern lights colored red, blue, green, and yellow, and hovering there, taking up half the sky, moving in a rippling fashion. Deanne had lived most her life there and knew the tricks of the world around her. She put two fingers in her mouth.